I want to open with the scripture, Matthew 16. It says, Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon of Arjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Most people who attend Mount Zion any length of time know that I believe that in the latter days of time, God is going to have a glorious church. The Bible says that when Jesus Christ comes, he's coming for a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And as this scripture declares, it's going to be a victorious people. Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. amen. Now, sometimes people look at the world or even look at the church and say, well, I don't see how that's possible. Well, I only believe it's possible because Jesus said it. How do we know if Jesus said it, it's true and it will come to pass? Amen. We need to have that understanding. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. He said, I will build my church. And he has been building his church now for 2,000 years. And I love church history, and I love to observe how he has been progressively working in the church over these years to bring us to such a place as this. And as you know, I believe he's taken us to a new place right now that he's been preparing us for. But indeed, this is the time for the fulfillment of that which God has spoken to move into that new realm in him. The setting of this particular scripture is Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he asked them a question. Well, who are people saying that I, the son of man, am? And they were telling all the things they were hearing. And well, some people say you're this prophet. Some say you're Elijah. And some others say that you're Isaiah the prophet and all these kind of things that are going on. And finally, Jesus looks to Peter and said, well, who do you say that I am? How do you know in the end is what do you believe? What do you know? And how many know God wants us to be a company of people where we all know? Amen? Amen. Peter, who am I? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And upon this rock I will build my church. What rock is he talking about? Well, he's talking about revelation. He's going to build his church by revelation. And that's what happens in the body of Christ through church history. All of a sudden, God will begin to reveal something, typically to a person. And sometimes it's a group of people are gathering together and God begins to pull them together. And they see something perhaps in the Bible that they've never seen before. And to me, that's the amazing thing about the Bible. I've been studying the Bible as a minister for 42 years and been reading the Bible since I was just a kid. So that goes back a few more years than that. And uh, I have studied the Word and I've searched through the Word. And it's just amazing to me how you can see something in the Bible that you never saw before. That's what the Bible calls revelation. It means that he has uncovered something to you. You see something that you've never seen before. Now, this is an important observation that I want you to understand. We're going to move in the days of the victorious church. We're moving into the days of the overcoming church. But it isn't going to be just a church who knows what they believe. It's going to be a church who know what they see. That's what revelation is. A lot of people believe, but when they look out at the world, they're discouraged. They see the darkness and they're overwhelmed by it. They see the obstacles and say, well, how can this ever happen? And because of that, they become overwhelmed. And well, if you challenge them, they'll say, well, I believe. But the question isn't what you believe, is what do you see? Do you see the darkmen? Watchmen, watchmen, what are the night? Well, the night comes, but also the day, says the mighty God. There is a dawning of a new day in God. And we have to be a people that are focusing on what it is that God is declaring because he's the God who calls the things that are not as though they were. That's what Abraham, our father, said as he heard the word of the Lord that he and his wife were going to have children. The situation got a lot worse before the found the promise came to pass and sometimes that's the way it is with God and I want to talk about that today because sometimes things getting worse is actually a preparation for the best that is yet to come so God says to his church you need to know by revelation the Bible says where there is no revelation the people go unrestrained 
But when you have a revelation and you see what God wants you to see, you're restrained, not by the circumstances you see or your emotions or your personal opinions, but you're guided by that word because you see something perhaps that nobody else can see. And that's what God wants us to understand in this day, which brings us to the story we read today about Ezekiel's vision of the dry bones. It tells us that the hand of the Lord came upon him and brought him in the spirit. How I many you know it's through the spirit that we receive our revelation? Amen. And that's why tonight we're just going to pray in the spirit and ask God to give us a revelation so that we can see what we've never seen before. Perhaps it says he brought me the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley that was full of dry bones. And as he caused him to pass by all around, he's looking at what he's seeing a whole valley. And it's basically a bunch of people who have died. They've deteriorated to the point that, well, there's just bones left and they're very, very dry, the Bible says. And then the Lord poses to him a question, son of man, can these bones live? How many know he gave a good answer? Oh, Lord, you know. <laughs> Lord's like, well, I know what I know, but what do you know? And that's why he had to take him into this prophetic journey. So he wasn't just hedging his bets on well, what God knows, but he understood God wanted him to know. And then the Bible to know something means not just that I have information in my head. It means to have an intimate connection with something. And a lot of times people have a religion that doesn't have an intimate connection. They know a lot of things, but there's no intimate connection. And sometimes people feel safe that way, so they only want a religion where it's about what you know up here rather than what you know in here. How many know God wants our heart? Amen. He wants us really to know. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, Ezekiel 37 is a very special uh, chapter to me because I really believe it's symbolic of the day and hour in which we live. But it was also a very important passage during what was called the Latter Rain Revival. Every once in a while you hear me talk about this, that back in 1948 there was a revival that was uh, given the name, the Latter Rain Revival. And I was trained at a church in Detroit, Bethesda Missionary uh, Temple, it was known of at the time. And uh, they were a great voice during that time. The pastor was M.D. Beale, it was a lady. And God began to speak to her and open her heart and he began to give her revelation. And her and others in those days began to realize, hey, the church has apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Why is that in the Bible and we don't practice it? And they used to prophesy to people and they would give them words. Literally until that time, 1948, the Pentecostal movement did not believe in prophecy, did not believe in what we call today fivefold ministry. They really didn't have an operation nor a practice of the gifts of the Spirit, believe it or not. To them, it was basically, I get saved, I get filled with the Holy Ghost, I speak in tongues as proof of that, and now I'm a Pentecostal Spirit-filled Christian. So I'm a step higher than the Baptist, so I'm a little closer, uh, but basically that's the end of it. Now, when the latter rain began to fall and churches began to see truths in the Bible that weren't evident heretofore, most of the Pentecostal denominations rejected it. And so all of the major denominations that you would know that are called Pentecostal, they usually have it right in their bylaws or uh, recorded in their websites. Well, we do not accept the latter rain. We do not accept fivefold ministry. We do not believe that prophecy should be so uh, oftentimes expressed in church. And they definitely don't believe in personal prophecy. Now, obviously, you can see the reason they didn't believe in fivefold ministry because if you have apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, how do you fit that into supervisor, district supervisor, superintendents, <laughs> pastor? Because when you're in a, a denomination, typically it's somewhat of a corporate structure. And so people always, just like in a business, trying to figure out how to get to the next level, how to get in the key church so you can get the key notice so you can get in the key place. And then somebody over here is saying, well, God has in his word a fivefold ministry and God has all this. And we're like, hey, that doesn't fit in. So they shut it all down. But there were people that received it. 
The latter rain revival started in 1948. As many of you know, that's the same year Israel became a nation. And so there has always been a prophetic tie between what is God is doing in the natural. The Bible says first that which natural, afterward that is spiritual. So Israel has been always a prophetic picture in a natural setting of what God is doing in the spiritual setting. And uh, I really believe this change is also going to show a change in the Middle East. There's going to be a, a, a time when we're going to see things happening there differently than we have in the past. Anytime Israel has ever done anything great in recent history, whether it was a six-day war or 1973, there was a, another war. And even when they became a nation in 1948, I know most of the Christians in America think, well, we got to be Israel's friend. Well, we've never been the ones that helped Israel. It was always divine provision that helped Israel, really. It's kind of a relatively new concept uh, that we come along to be an ally of theirs. And, and I think that's important for us to understand because the truth is, it's God that makes the difference. Amen? And we got to know that and understand that. And so I really believe there is a prophetic tie there, like I said, and that's what happened in the early days of the latter rain movement. It was such a powerful move of God. And this is one of the chapters they talked about because it talks about the power of prophetic ministry and how that a prophet prophesied to a whole valley of dry bones. And they began to realize, boy, there's power in prophecy. Wow, you can actually make a declaration, and if God has given you that declaration, it goes forth in power, and it becomes creative. It becomes life-giving. That's amazing. And that's, of course, again, one of the beautiful things about that great visitation and what it is that came out of all of those things that were going on. God was doing something awesome. And this is something, again, that we have to see God is doing in our day in which we live. Again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. How many know that seems a little stupid talking to bones? Come on. Prophesy to the bones and say to them, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. That doesn't seem to make any sense, but it was those dry bones that represented what God was going to do that was so powerful. But how many know with God, you go, go step by step. We oftentimes pray and we want to see the whole thing happen all at once. Well, the Bible says that the just shall live by faith. And when we live by faith, that means it's one step at a time what God is going to do, amen? And so in this case, there was a process, and the first process seemed kind of simple and kind of corny, really. And the Bible says, it says, thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. Now, how many know that bones are living? How many know your bones are alive? We usually think of our bones as just support system to our body, but they do a whole lot more than that. And obviously, uh, as you develop through life, those bones have to grow. So you know bones are alive. So the first stage is all he knows is God's going to make the bones live. How many know that means you have a belly full of skeletons? <laughs> about that time, you'd be like, ah! Something about skeletons are scary, amen? I mean, even though you know bo bones are alive, a skeleton walk into church, you'd be like, oh my gosh, there's a skeleton here. When I was a kid, I always had this recurring scary dream, and I'd be chased by these bad people, and they'd light up, and I'd look, and they'd turn to skeletons, and I'd go, ah, take off. Something about skeletons. I don't like being scared. How about you? My wife, Bonnie, she says she doesn't like to be scared, but I don't like scary movies, but I do like to go with Bonnie, because she's a screamer kind of adds a little ambiance to the story and sometimes be, honey, you're the only one screaming. Did you notice that? Because she, she'll scream because she anticipates something to happen. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't happen, amen? And I mean, you know, we're, we're kind of like that with the way we walk with God. You know, oftentimes we, we see things and it's, well, not exactly what we were looking for. Uh, I was praying for God to do something and all I've done is created skeletons. This is scary. But you see, God wants us to understand that living by faith means we take everything one step at a time and recognize when God is going to do something that he's going to do it in that process. But the important thing is hearing the voice of God 
and living by what you hear, which causes you to see, amen? So you're not living with natural perception, but you're living with spiritual perception because God has given you the capacity. I always limit myself in how much news I listen to and how much comments I hear from the world because to tell you the truth, nobody in the world knows what's going on, but the Holy Spirit does. And how many know in the midst of this world, I'll give the Lord a praise on that. In the midst of the world in which we live, God is doing something awesome. So if you just listen to the natural events, you're gonna miss what God is doing. So God says, tune in your ear, get ready, because God says, I want you to prophesy and speak to the bones, for surely I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And then he says, and I will put sinews on you and bring flesh. Thank you, Jesus, for the flesh. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And this is what I love. It says, then you shall know that I am the Lord. How many know what God's trying to do in the earth is glorify his name? Yes. Now, what I love about that is I always believe that God wants to share his glory with his people. We just have to always remember what's God's part and what's our part. If you try to take over God's part, you're going to be in big trouble. But when you have spiritual perception and God gives you revelation, you can clearly see, well, what is it that's your part and what is it God's part? And as soon as you begin to walk in that, there's, a, there's an evenness there. There's a peace that comes along in the situation and God's life is able to come as we walk in the fullness of these beautiful things that comes when we walk according to the word of the Lord. So I prophesied I was, as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in him. Again, he prophesied as he was commanded. He had to hear what God was saying, and then he had to be willing to speak it. The power of life and death, the Bible says, is in the words that we speak. But that's not just any words. That's when we speak the Lord's words. Amen. And so there was a noise and a suddenly he begins to put everything together. And I put over this the scary part because how do you know? Something about rattling bones sounds scary to me. Amen. I want you to see here, too, how God always builds, again, line upon line, precept upon precept. And so we have to understand how that God works the way he does. He does it always in a process. And so as we walk in the process, it starts with declaring what God has said. The Lord spoke to me a very long time ago, and he said, I want you to begin to prophesy it's a new day. And he said, and when you prophesy this, the only people who are going to be able to hear are the people who have a heart for me. And if you will open up your heart, you will receive the word. The word will begin to work in you and prepare you for that day. The first time I ever prophesied it was in the Spanish service when we were still meeting over at the uh, Mount Zion Center location. And, and I've had this word working in me ever since. Now, some people think when prophecy comes, it's supposed to immediately be apparent what you're prophesying or declaring that you would see it. But that isn't the way God works, does he? He starts by rattling the bones. And after the bones start rattling, that's when things start coming together. And then when they start coming together, that's when the Lord begins to add the many parts to what he says he's going to do. So I'm very excited about this time because guess what? I know God has done some awesome things at Mount Zion over the years, but I also know he has been preparing us for such a time as this. Amen, church? And so that's very exciting for me to recognize that God always is a God who works in this process. Now look what it goes on to say here. It's not turning for me. Also he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, they lived, and stood upon their feet an exceeding great army. Now, he says, you got to prophesy to the breath. 
He's prophesied to the bones. He's laid the foundation for something. And as he prophesied to the bones, they come to life, first of all, before there's any skin or anything, as you know. But then he adds all the different parts. And then breath begins to come. And then he says, you got to prophesy to the breath. So you're not just prophesying one stage, you're prophesying every single stage because you have to keep speaking the word of the Lord. Come from the four winds, O breath. We have to understand something. You know, if wind, I was talking to somebody about this before church comes from the south, how you know it's going to push you north? Wherever it comes, it's going to push you in a certain direction. Church, when the winds are coming in four directions, it has nowhere to take you but up. I tell you, the four winds need to blow right now. And a lot of people are blown in one direction or another direction. The Bible says we should not be tossed about by every wind of doctrine, which oftentimes people are, because there's winds blowing in every different direction and people get carried away. And sometimes they get extreme in something that's right at first, but then it carries them away, if you would. But the Lord says, I'm going to have a people of balance in these days, says the Marty God, and we're going to have a wind that's going to blow from all four different directions, and we got to prophesy that wind that it would begin to blow. And I really believe that God wants us to understand that and how important that is. Well, in the Latter Rain Revival, as they spoke about this, they always talked about this last part. It was oftentimes spoken. I'm familiar with it. I have a, actually a sermon that's printed out that Pastor Rick Munoz had given me years ago. It's in a, something I keep on my desk about this very chapter. We prophesied in those times. It says, so I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet in exceedingly great army. And so that's what they thought would be the outcome of the latter rain revival well it actually wasn't it was a revival of breath blowing upon the dead it later on became known as the charismatic renewal and over a 70 year period of time really in the last 40 years of that literally hundreds of millions of people have received the baptism of the holy spirit now, if you see what God's doing in the world, church, it's so amazing. You know, sometimes we get caught up in our small personal world, or we get caught up in our friends that it is a circle, and we think the world is, well, our circle that we're living in. But when you see what's happening in the world, and you're aware that literally hundreds of millions of people have come to the Lord and been baptized in the Holy Spirit in recent days of history, you can't look at history and read numbers like that and not be convinced God's moving in a mighty way in the earth. Amen, church? Amen. However, we need to understand something. As they thought they would see as a part of that revival, this time when the body began to stand up and become that great army, that didn't happen, but we're living a day when that will happen. But why not, now I want to talk to you about how this process works so that we can fully uh, appreciate what God is doing right now in our day. A couple of weeks ago, I read this scripture. The voice said, cry out. And he said, well, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and all is good enough is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades because of the breath of the Lord what blows upon it. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God abides forever. Look, notice I have over here disassembly. I hope that's a real word. It didn't spell check it, but I made it up if I, it isn't. Because I was thinking about how something can be assembled and how it can be disassembled. I've always shared how I have this strength and I'm a good reader. I've always did well in literary things. I can read. I can read very fast, have a very high comprehension, and I've always had a very good memory. It's not quite as good as it used to be, but it's always been a, a, a good memory. Sometimes I can quote a whole chapter of the Bible. It's not really that hard for me because it's just right there in that memory bank. So that's my area of strength. My area of weakness is anything has to do with, like, putting concepts together like an engineer would, or if you're getting into math where you have to come up with all these equations and stuff like that. It's kind of like when I was a kid, we used to have arithmetic. In seventh grade, they started what they called modern math. And our whole seventh grade class failed because they started not just using numbers, but they added letters. How do you add up letters? That's weird. I know that sounds dumb to 
you that I would make a statement like that, but that's the way it was with me. It's kind of like modern math. Oh, what are we going to do? Because I've never been good at mechanical things. I've always shared stories about my cars. I never could quite figure out how they work. To me, it's a miracle every time you start a car and it actually works. And now they have uh, the newest car I have right now. And you stop at a light, it shuts off, starts back up when you're ready to take off. I have a minor panic attack every time I go to a red light because I'm like, <laughs> how do I know this is actually going to start back up? But so far, so good. Anyway, when I was raising kids Christmas time, it said some assembly needs is required. I wouldn't buy it unless I absolutely had to. And then, of course, I took it to my brother Bill's house so he could assemble it for me. And I've always been the kind of person that's kind of like, well, if I assemble it and it kind of works, that's good enough for me. Why would, how would anything work perfectly? It never did make sense to me uh, because I'm not very mechanical. And so like, I'm like, you know, you mean this can work better? I remember once uh, my brother Bill was riding in my car and he said, do you notice your shocks are totally not working? I go, what exactly do shocks do? <laughs> well, if you had good shocks, your car wouldn't be going like this, you know? And I'm like, that's good. Give me some shocks, hallelujah. <laughs> so anyway, if I get it together and it's working, that's good for me. Don't have to feel comfortable. Don't have to be smooth. It just has to work. Well, I'm not like God in that because God, he likes it to be perfect. This is a scary word I use a lot. Not laying again the foundation, let us go on to perfection. Oh, that's not possible. Well, God said it. He's the master engineer. He's called a designer in Hebrews chapter 11. He's building a city which has foundations, the Bible says, whose builder and designer is God. Isn't that amazing? So God does something, and it, it, it's looking real good, and we're all excited about it. Just like the Light of Rain revival, the Spirit of the Lord's movement, everybody's come to church, it's wonderful, charismatic movement. People can't get enough church, so then they start meeting in restaurants and stadiums. Everybody wanted more of the breath, more of the presence, more, 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 more. It, it just seems so exciting, all the things that God was doing. Amen? And God looks at it and he says, well, that's good, but it's not where I want him to be. So you know what God does is a part of his process. You can see it in history. He sometimes disassembles things. I don't like that, God. If it works, just let it keep working. Well, it was good for a while, but I'm getting ready for the next phase. But in order for me to put it together right, I've got to disassemble it. Got to take it all apart. So I can put it back together. And when I put it back together, I'm actually going to add some parts. And when it's done, you're going to go, wow, why didn't we always see this? Why didn't we always know it? Why wasn't it always this way? But what does he have to do sometimes? Disassemble. That's why two weeks ago, actually three weeks ago, I shared a message about this. The voice had cried. This is another one of those prophetic voices. And sometimes prophetic voices can be very irritating. The voice said, cry. And I'm like, well, what do you want me to cry? All flesh is grass and all the goodliness thereof as the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. It's the word of the Lord that abides forever. This is one of those disassembly things he's saying. He's saying like, well, there comes a point in time where all of a sudden flesh works becomes evident. You realize God needs to do something more. Because what did he say to the prophet? He said, when I'm done, everybody's going to say, wow, look what the Lord has done. They're not going to say, wow, look what you've done. Come on. It's going to be what the Lord has done. Because it's exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ask or think. And sometimes we do mix a little flesh in there. And we're kind of like, Lord, I know you want what you want, but this is what I want. Well, I factor you in, my child. <laughs> and you'll be happy when I'm done. But sometimes that means I have to work over you. And so there's this disassemble if you would and then the next week I added this next verse 1 Corinthians chapter 3 because sometimes the Bible says this is one of the way God looks at it 
God has laid a foundation. At Mount Zion, we're very strong on foundations. But when you go and build on your foundations, some people build with wood and hay and stubble. These are things that the Bible calls flesh works. But others, you build with silver, precious stones, and gold. And so what do I do? Well, what happens is I send the fire through. Wow. And what I burn through, guess what? The gold, the precious stones, and the silver, it's still there. But all the flesh works, the wood, the hay, and the stubble, guess what? They're burned up. So basically... I've disassembled and I put in the trash all the things I don't want anymore. My, I was just thinking this week about some of the stories about my mom and she'd tell me about things when I was little. And she said, yeah. She says, I remember when we broke you the bottle, you just didn't want to give up on the bottle. And back then, they lived in this place where they actually burned the trash out in the backyard. So my dad said, well, just burn that bottle. And so oh, that's exactly what she did. And she said, I came in the house with a bottle half burnt. And I'm going, Baba. <laughs> and, and you know, that kind of describes us as Christians. You know, God throws something in the fire and we go back and say, My Baba, I want it back. No, it's time to move on, child. You needed it for a while, but you don't need it now. I'm taking you to a new place. It's a new beginning. You had to see some flowers fade and you had to see some grass wither. But the good thing is I burned it up so you don't have to keep looking at it. Come on. And, and so really, you know, as the latter rain revival happened and they had this great work, you know, we in recent years, I really believe we've seen a lot of the flesh in the movement. We've seen some flowers fading, some grass withering, and we've seen some wood hay stubble getting burned up. That's all signs that God is doing something amazing because a disassembly is going to come before the greatest work that God's going to do. This week, as the Lord brought this chapter to me, I was thinking about this. You know, we think it's an awesome story to think how the prophet looked at this valley of very dry bones. And the Lord says, can these bones live? Now, I want you to see the picture of Ezekiel's life. Because Ezekiel was born in a family of priests. And when he was about 30 years of age, when he would have finally been able to be a part of the priestly class and work in the temple that God had in Jerusalem at the time, Babylon had sent in an army and defeated them and taken away some captives. And Ezekiel was one of those captives. And he's by the rivers of Babylon. And all of a sudden, he starts getting visions of the glory of the Lord. And guess what? He saw the vision of the glory of God departing from Jerusalem and being held in Babylon for a while. Now, keep in mind, he was a part of first wave. If you know the history of it, you know that there came a time when Babylon went back and they then destroyed the holy city and destroyed the temple. And so, first of all, Ezekiel has been in the holy city. He's on the verge of being a priest. He's all excited and he's carried away captive and he's in Babylon. And that's when God says, well, you thought you were going to be a priest, but you're going to be a prophet instead because there's not going to need, be a need for a priesthood. Because as a matter of fact, I'm going to let him destroy the holy city in the temple and that's what he prophesied and in the book of Ezekiel it actually comes to pass all these things happen and that's when he sees the valley of dry bones so he's not just looking at a people that have died and they're there in the valley of dry bones he remembers the good days and now he has to see the bad days and God has given him the faith to know that God is in every single day. Because God has a plan. And sometimes that plan is taking something that seems so wonderful and you're on the verge of something really great and saying, well, that's on hold. I'm going to do something else. I'm going to take you over here and I'm going to do a work. But guess what? There's going to come a day when you're going to believe that which is disassembled is not only going to come back together, but it's going to come back together with a greater glory and a power that it's ever had before, says the mighty God. Isn't that awesome, church? 
And that's what I really believe God wants us to understand because some people in their personal lives, you've seen that disassembly, if you would. You've seen the fire. You've seen the withering. You've seen the fading. You've seen the crisis. I, I truly believe with everything within me that the worldwide crisis that's being faced right now is God is at work in the earth. And I know there's all kinds of things that are going on. There's a lot of darkness involved in these things, but the important thing is God's going to use it for his glory. Amen. Did you hear what I just said, church? Because there are a whole lot of things that needed to be disassembled, but God says his people, are you going to just sit there thinking about the disassembly or are you going to receive the vision to see the reassembling of all these things coming together that the glory of the Lord can come to pass. That's why it says here in Ezekiel chapter 37, he says, then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, I want you to read this part with me. Our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. That's what Ashley was talking about in her exhortation about the hope. We've got to be a people of hope. But these people say, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we've been cut off. And that really would be the same thing Ezekiel could feel as the prophet, but what happened is he allowed himself to receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit so that he would see something different. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when... Read it. I have opened your graves, O oh my people, and brought you out of your graves. Resurrection is the ultimate power of God. It's what we'll be celebrating on Easter. Amen. How many know when something's dead and it comes back to life? There's nothing like that. Amen. O oh, death, where is your sting? The Bible says, O oh, grave, where is your victory? It's been swallowed up in resurrection power. And that's what this chapter is about in church. We're going to know the power of the life-giving spirit in this day as never before. But we have to know that God's going to do it in such a way that's going to give him glory. But he definitely wants us to be a part of it. And I put over there the talk because if you see what's happening in the natural, you're going to be just like the children of Israel. Oh, our bones are dry. Our hope is lost. We've been cut off. Remember how it used to be. And the prophet says, why don't you quit talking about the way it used to be? Because God's doing something better than you've ever seen before. It's time to change your talk. It's time to get the talk of the kingdom and let God give you the powerful words that you might speak, says the mighty God. So he said to me, and I'm backing up again, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came upon them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army, new words to speak. Now, I have one more scripture to share, and after that, we're going to pray in the Spirit like we always do in our Holy Spirit service, and then we're all going to prophesy. Now, you're not going to get your word directly from the Lord. He gave it to me to give to you. So I'm going to tell you what you're going to prophesy. But if you'll receive the word and you allow God to let you speak it and ask God to give you an anointing, I really believe that God can give us new conversation. But more than that, God gives us the power to prophesy and declare to bring life to other people, says the mighty God. But just like I said, they look that the people would stand up and become exceeding great army. This is the day it's going to happen. This is the day of the awakening. And Isaiah commanded, he said, awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion. Well, I think you should read this with me. Awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion. Okay, how many will say, okay, I will. Okay, well, put on your beautiful garments. Get dressed up for this thing, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for the uncircumcised and the unclean shall no longer come to you. 
Now, what are we going to do next? If we're going to awake and we're going to rise in our strength, what do we need to do? Okay, let's say that one one more time. Shake yourself from the death. Will you do that? Okay, then when you do that, you can arise and sit down. That doesn't make a lot of sense, but it says, it's basically saying, stand up, but be rested. Because we're going to move forward, but it's not going to be from a position of warfare. It's going to be from a position of rest because the Lord's going to do the work. Oh, Jerusalem, what should we do? How many are willing to lose yourself tonight? From every negative thought, it would make you think that God's not going to do everything that he says he's going to do in the earth, in your life, in your children, in your children's children, says the mighty God. Loose yourself from the bonds of your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Well, this is what we're going to prophesy. We're going to prophesy, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. And as we're doing this, I'm going to ask every one of you to think about people you want that breath to go on. And even for yourself, you can say, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on me that I may live. Or breathe on those that they may live. You can change it that much, but we're going to prophesy to the wind. I mean, we're talking about the breath of God. When God first created mankind from the, breath, from the earth, he breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and we became alive. But the first Adam was a living being. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, was a life-giving spirit. And God says that's what we're called to be right now.